Hello, this is Brock Lemires. Welcome back to EELE 461-561. This lecture video is associated with the Wednesday meeting time on April 1st. Okay, so <clears throat> we have been looking at capacitive crosstalk. And so again, what we're going to do is you're going to watch this short video and then have a short little quiz. Uh, it's going to be homework number 10. Uh, but let's talk about crosstalk. Okay, so we're, we're, this is what we kind of covered last time. You have an, an aggressor line <clears throat> and a victim line, and we are treating these both as distributed systems. Okay, so that means that uh, there's a delay from point A to point B. And what we are interested in <clears throat> is how much voltage gets coupled over to the victim. And we define two areas of interest for us. First one is called the near end, and the, the other one is called the far end. The far end is where you're going to have the receiver of the victim, <clears throat> and that's important because it might flip a bit. <clears throat> and then the near end is important because it, we can often measure what the crosstalk is uh, when you can't see the far end crosstalk, <clears throat> and we can get an idea for what is actually going on. So we can actually use the near end waveform to characterize the actual coupling here. Okay, so what we're ultimately after <clears throat> is a percentage of how much voltage gets coupled over onto the E victim. And we define these two terms, near-end crosstalk coefficient and far-end crosstalk coefficient. And we call them next and fext. So NEXT and FEXT. And what we really want is we want them to be voltages. And we want to just come up with some kind of ratio that gives us the ability to say, hey, I had a volt on VA and I multiply it by some coefficient and then I was able to come up with, you know, 0.2 times that voltage was what was at, uh, was what was at the near end. <clears throat> Same thing with the far end. Okay, so what we're gonna do is today we'll walk through the capacitive crosstalk. And remember, due to superposition, we can treat the capacitive coupling and the inductive coupling separate. And then at the end, we just add them together. <clears throat> okay, so let's think about capacitive coupling. Okay, so no, there are inductors in here in terms of where the waveform is uh, in any given time, in terms of there's inductance behind it and inductance in front of it, but we care about the mechanism that puts energy from the aggressor onto the victim. Okay, so an aggressor line propagates down the, the line and you have a mutual capacitance that is per unit length, right? So we have CM prime and that just means that you can't just take the area of these coupled conductors and, and use one capacitance. You have to look at the little spatial or how much capacitance, how much mutual capacitance this wave sees, okay, as it propagates. And, you know, capacitance is C dV dt, right? The current is injected uh, based on that equation. That's the governing equation for a capacitor. And so if we care about what gets injected onto the victim, we basically do this calculation where we say the current went through the capacitor, that's the mechanism for a capacitor to couple, and it's governed by CM dV dt, okay? What's, what's interesting about it though is that you can think of this wave as a voltage source that is traveling from the source to the load. And so it's, it's basically like just this, and it's injecting current as it goes, okay? And so it's not like this one-time thing. It's just like, view, 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 and it goes over. What's interesting is that when the current hits the victim, it sees 50 ohms both ways. Okay, so it looks to the left, looks to the right, and it splits evenly. And so this, this little injection of current that happens as this wave travels down, it actually splits evenly, and some of it travels backwards, and some of it travels forwards. And that's where you get the near-end crosstalk, and then you get the far-end crosstalk due to capacitance, okay? All right, so if we go, if you look at all the little math here, we're ultimately trying to get to something that gives us a, a ratio of voltages based upon parameters that we know. And the parameters that we're going to know, you know, they, they all drop off in the end, but, you know, we've given this, like, geometry that in material dielectrics that give us these mutual capacitance and load capacitance, <clears throat> Or line capacitance, and so that's going to be a key thing, a key thing to this. Okay, so if you think about the CM that we want to use, it's basically the CM per unit length times delta X, and delta X would be like you know a little chunk right here. Uh, but that little chunk, it's almost like you say for the rise time, how much of this 
victim does it see, right? How much does it actually see? And you know, you know, it's kind of that same concept of like when you look into a transmission line, you can't see the end of it. Well, when this wave looks into the victim, it can't see the end of it on either side. And so what it sees is it sees a little bit going this way and a little bit going that way. And it has to do with, once again, the rise time. And so you basically have this kind of this, uh, this little length here. It's kind of the spatial extent of the rise time is a term that people use for it. And it's the delta X can be described as, uh, you know, distance equals rate times time. So you have velocity is the rate and time is the rise time. And so you can kind of start relating these things back together. <clears throat> now, this is great to come up with the CM, but then you go, well, okay, how I want to find that total current. I got to multiply it by dV dt. So then you take your traditional capacitance equation, you plug in this little uh, new expression for CM, and then you go, well, what's dV dt? And it's like, well, V is the voltage you're launching, T is T rise. And so if you just kind of pop those in there, uh, you'd essentially be able to cancel out the T rise times. And what you'd be left with is an interesting equation that says this current is related to the capacitance, of course, but it's also related to the velocity. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. And so that makes it sound like it's more related to the actual materials. And it's like, well, turns out it is. Okay. And so, and then you multiply that by the voltage. All right, so now that expression gives us an amount of current that comes over here. And now this is the it is a really interesting part. First and foremost, the amount of current or and ultimately voltage is going to be divided by two, okay, because it went left and right. But it's also going to have another factor of two division because it's spread out over two propagation delays. And so as this, think about this wave is traveling down here on the aggressor and it's charging up, charging up the victim. <clears throat> and every time it, it injects current, the current is traveling back this way. But think about the point at which the aggressor vo voltage gets to the end of the line. It had just injected its last amount of noise onto the victim. And so then the, it coupled for an entire propagation delay, one TD, but then once the aggressor was done, this line had, had noise injected that still is going to be moving backwards. So the waveform for near end capacitive crosstalk actually lasts for two TD. So it's really interesting. When the aggressor's done, the victim is still have still has this noise that was injected that needs to travel all the way back. <laughs> so here's the characteristic waveform that you see when you look at near end crosstalk for capacitance you are going to have, a, it's going to step up to a particular voltage, which we call V, v near end. And that's, this is only capacitance right here. And it is going to stay up for two propagation delays and then go away. And so this is like the classic waveform that you always see if, if you have capacitive crosstalk. So when I come down here and I say, okay, well, let's look at that IC again. I have now my factor of one half times one half. And that comes from half of it is due to it going left and right, so it splits and goes forward and backwards. And then the other half is that it's spread out over two propagation delays. And then of course we have our equation for mutual capacitance, velocity, and voltage. So it's a one fourth factor. Okay, we gotta get this back into voltages because currents, you know, what, what are we talking about here? We need a number, <laughs> okay? And so now what you're talking about is you're really, if you think about it, at any moment in time, the wave is essentially blocked in terms of current, it's blocked by the inductance that sees going forward. It's blocked by the inductance that sees going backwards. And when it couples, same thing happens on the victim. It, if a current is injected right here, <clears throat> the transmission line model that's made out of inductors and capacitors will actually see inductance that way and inductance that way. So the voltage that develops is really only dictated by the low line capacitance of the victim. So here's the aggressor. It's got a line capacitance and it's got a mutual capacitance. And this is what happens that couples it, but then the current goes directly into there. So this actually ends up kind of being this capacitive voltage divider equation. And so if you work through all that, <clears throat> you know, you basically have, you know, here's the mutual capacitance, the same equation that we did. Oh, but KCL says that the current that K 
came out of the aggressor, so it came out of this line capacitance. KCL says it can't go left, can't go right, so it all has to go over here, and then it can't go left, can't go right, so it has to go down the line capacitance over here. And these two are matched lines, so the CL is the same. So what ends up happening is that you write a, vo a voltage equation for the how much an equation for how much voltage is on this capacitance, how much is on this capacitance coupled through here, and what you end up getting is you have a, an expression that is proportional to the mutual capacitance to the line capacitance. And so this is pretty amazing. So you, you almost, I almost think of it like this. You had energy in this line capacitance that was then shot through this, and then this mutual capacitance w dumped it all into this line capacitance. But since these were equal, it was almost like the source and the final had the same capacitance, the same ability to store charge, but how much came over was proportional to the mutual capacitance. This mutual capacitance's ability to transfer charge. And so you end up with an expression that looks like this. It's very simple. It's VB over VA is proportional to CM over CL. And so it's like, wow. So that's how I converted it back to voltage. So that's pretty sweet. And so when you stick all this together, your, your factor now you have that one fourth in here. Now we're back into currents, or excuse me, we're into voltages right now. And it, it's even more simple because we have V near end over VA is equal to CM over, C, over CL, but it's one fourth, okay? So we finally got to something that's actually kind of neat. And this does suck because you have to know the CM and the CL. So it still is an equation where you're like, I still have to do like a field solver to understand that. And that's, that's very true because these are these are geometric, you know, the, the geometries dictate what's going on. So this is the classic thing that you see. Now, here's the big part is if you can measure this with an oscilloscope, then you can actually figure out what some of these values are. But this is the classic expression. OK, what about the far end? The far end is going to have the exact same behavior except for this. As the wave travels forward, it's going to inject and we are caring about the current on the victim that's moving forward. Well, think about this, the victim current can't move faster than the wave on the aggressor. So it, it is actually moving at the same speed. So they're both traveling down these lines at the same time. And it's actually integrating as you go, because every time you get to a new region where you couple more, you have more current, more current, more current, more current, more current, more current. And you basically are just building up this wave front. It's like this wave in the ocean that you keep adding water to and more water, more water, more water. And then all of a sudden it gets to the end and then all of a sudden you you have this same type of thing where you get this little blip and it only it doesn't last very long it's basically lasts as long as the rise time but your equation for it is the v far end over v aggressor is going to be cm or cl again but you have to have and then there's a one half in there of course but you have this new factor which accounts for the entire length of the coupling region as the wave was generated so this is like the whole length of the transmission line over the velocity times T rise dictates how, how big this thing is. And so you can see from this equation, obviously it's going to be proportional to the length of the coupled region. That makes sense. But it's going to be inversely proportional to T rise. So if T rise gets really big, which means slow, this is going to go way down. And that makes sense too, because you know slower rise time doesn't couple as much. Slower meaning T rise is big. Okay, so that was kind of a large, that was kind of a long way to say, <laughs> here's your equations for near end capacitive crosstalk, and they are proportional to CM and CL, most importantly, but then only the, when you, when you look at like the parameters that we have, so you have T rise, it really influences the far end capacitive crosstalk, and it also accounts for the lar or the length. Okay, but when you come back to near end crosstalk, you basically draw the waveform that looks exactly like that. And then what you do is you say, I know how long it is because of the 2TD, and then I know how high it is based upon the coupled regions. Okay, that's it. So I'll give you a little, uh, a simple little multiple choice quiz so you can uh, get some more points, and I will see you later.